All right. Uh, thanks, Dave, for the introduction. Um, and thanks, everyone, for uh, attending tonight um, and being interested in learning what you can do to help your team out when there isn't someone like me around. Uh, so, you know, working with the Thunder, I, I do see the value of having a medical professional on the team. And um, the unfortunate part is, is that um, it can be kind of expensive and, and, oh, you know, not feasible for, you know, high school teams to have someone. And unless there's maybe a parent that has uh, some medical background or training, um, from the sounds of it, most teams really don't have someone. And, um, and I think that a lot of you coaches have had the experience of being the medical uh, person just because maybe you took some uh, some kin classes back in university or possibly because you know how to tape an ankle they were like great you're up you get to deal with anything that happens medically uh, so hopefully we can kind of shed some light on that um, so just to let you know who I am I am I am a physical therapist I uh, do work with the Thunder um, been working with them for a number of years, but I also have a day job, um, so I have to, you know, pay the bills somehow. So I do work out of the university, and I treat really anything and everything, um, any musculoskeletal type of injuries, but also uh, do a fair bit of concussion and uh, vestibular rehab, so dizziness and stuff. But in reality, my true passion is is the sporting realm. Um, so that's why I have my day job, so I can pay for my my passion. Uh, but part of the reason why I enjoy working with the team is because I get to see some pretty cool things. Um, lots of interesting injuries. Uh, it's way better than sitting in an office all day. So I get to see some, you know, kind of cool things. But the, the biggest thing is just, you know, that feeling of being part of a team. So, um, of course, I will uh, definitely have to thank the Thunder for letting me invo be involved with them. So just to kind of give you guys an idea of what of a medical does is um, what you guys typically see is kind of me standing on the field with my fanny pack on. Um, hopefully I'm just standing around and not doing a whole lot. And sometimes you'll see me taping. Um, that's typically what most people see. Um, but the thing is, is that, you know, there's a lot more to what uh, a medical individual does, uh, especially when they work with the team um, you know, every night at all practices, all games and that sort of stuff. And, and really what this slide is just trying to show is that, um, you know, there, there's a lot that we do every night, preseason, postseason, um, you know, before games, after games and all that sort of stuff. But the point is, is that I know that coaches have a list twice as long as this. And um, so the question is, how does a coach do all what they need to do, as well as all of what I do? And the answer really is, you don't. <laughs> uh, but that's why you're here, you kind of, you have to be able to pick your battles and figure out what you're able to do, and how you can provide some sort of um, healthy, safe environment for your team, while not having um, a medical professional kind of, you know, taking that, that lead and being able to provide those services. So um, so this is kind of what I'm hoping to go over. Um, it is a lot of topics packed into a, an hour. So I literally breeze upon all of it. I really don't go into detail about anything. Uh, I apologize. Maybe if I come again next year or years to come, there can maybe be a specific topic uh, that I can kind of delve really, really deep into. But for now, this year, it's it's definitely just kind of talk like touching the, the very minimum of these topics. So um, also the, um, you know, medical staff isn't really in the phases of, of coaching. So I decided to make my own three phases. The first is the preparation. Uh, the second is what you need to know. And then the third is some resources. And so hopefully we can kind of get a little bit of information to, uh, you know, stick and help you out there. So that first phase is preparation. Uh, I think it's absolutely necessary that there is an adult on the team that has basic first aid. Basic first aid expires every three years. And so if you've taken it five, six, seven, eight years ago, uh, it doesn't count anymore. You need to update it. Um, and I highly suggest that an adult has this first aid because do you really want that 16 year old girl to be dealing with the emergency situation? I don't think it's the best idea. 
So um, it's great to have student trainers and kind of leave them to do the majority of it, but someone that is responsible, uh, well, I mean, we're talking about football coaches here, semi-responsible, um, needs to kind of take charge and be able to deal with an actual emergency situation. And I cannot teach you in an hour how to deal with emergency situations. Um, there's lots of training out there. Uh, St. John's Ambulance in Regina, Red Cross Regina. Um, there's a private company called JT First Aid Consulting. Um, University has some courses as well. So highly recommend, if not one, all of coaches should have some sort of basic first aid. Some other optional trainings is, um, you know, it, it's super helpful to have some taping information because, uh, you know, when it comes to hurt versus injured, um, if they are just hurt, you can help them out by taping it properly. And yes, this is uh, a possibility for um, the, uh, the student trainers to have this type of training, but it also doesn't hurt for the, the coaches to have it because also if you say, can you do this for your player? And then they say, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and you've taken the training with them. You can be like, yeah, you do. I was there. <laughs> so you can keep them a little bit accountable of what they should be able to do as well. Um, another thing, so there, there are courses out there. One is by the Sports Med Science Council and they've developed a course specifically for student trainers, coaches, and parents. Um, and it's, it's really well done, um, you know, contacting them uh, for that would be a good option. Another option is even just contacting a local physical therapy clinic and seeing if they'll put something together for you. Um, even just a couple hours, you know, tape showing you how to do an ankle, a wrist, and a, a thumb, like super valuable. Um, so don't be scared to use uh, that as a resource. Uh, a sport first responder course or just a normal responder course um, is a little bit more in depth than compared to um, just a first aid course. So lots of options out there through uh, Red Cross, St. John Ambulance, um, Sport Physio Canada specifically uh, does a sport first responder course. Um, and it is a little bit shorter than your typical one. And sometimes we let, uh, you know, non-medical professionals attend it, but um, usually they just kind of sneak in. Uh, and then some other courses that are super beneficial for being a coach is concussion awareness, injury prevention, drug awareness, and all of these courses can be provided and accommodated or um, kind of worked so it fits your setting um, by the Sports Med Science Council. So some options of other trainings that is beneficial. So once you've taken your basic first aid, you're going to learn that you might need to throw together an emergency action plan. This is actually just a piece of paper that has information that is valuable in case of an emergency. It's also the practice of putting it together and going through with the people involved in it uh, so that everyone knows what they need to do in an emergency. So this, uh, this sheet will have kind of facility information, roles outlined, equipment you have, um, you know, a plan of how to get the ambulance on, on the field, or who's gonna unlock the gate, that sort of stuff. So um, some key information on that would be the different roles. Um, first would be the charge person. So this is the person that has the most medical training. Uh, they're gonna be telling the people what to do. With your basic first aid, you might have the most uh, medical training on in the facility. So you would be the charge person. And that would be determined ahead of the game, before your practice, whatever. And you've kind of discussed, okay, if there's an emergency, I'm going to be the charge person. So I will kind of make sure that this emergency is being dealt with. Your second person is your call person. They're the one that's standing by and they're ready to make the call to 911 because they know where the facility is. They can give that address. Um, they know how to get the ambulance on the field. And like I said, they're standing by to find about information about this, this injury and the athlete themselves. Uh, you can also have a crowd control person. So this might be just someone that clearly keeps people away from the, uh, you know, the injury. Um, they might even let the ambulance in or direct it where to where it needs to go. Um, you know, and they can just be there helping as needed. So having that third person on hand knows that they need to come when there is an injury in case that they're needed. So uh, this is kind of a condensed um, emergency action plan. So it looks super busy, but they're usually not, they're not busy really at all. Um, just has a lot of information regarding who the charge person is, who the call person is. Is there an on-site medical doctor? If not, you would say no one. <laughs> uh, who's gonna, you know, unlock gates if you need them. So that might be the manager of the facility. 
Um, another thing is having uh, stock of what uh, equipment you have. So if there is an emergency, do you have anything or do you literally need to get them off site and call 911? Because um, if you don't have any equipment for emergency, that's likely the case anyways. But um, this form is, is commonly filled out by a home team and then passed on to uh, the away team so that they also have that information as well. So what do you need about, to know about an EAP? Well, first thing, Google EAP template, pick one, print it off, fill it out. Easy peasy. Or you can just email me and I can send you a blank one, whatever works. Uh, you also want to take into account what kind of medical equipment you have. The biggest thing is, is that, um, you know, in an emergency, you always want to have an AED because you never know how it's going to end up. And most facilities have an AED somewhere. When you have an, EA, an EAP plan, or then you've already went and looked for it, you know where it is, and then you can tell them exactly where it is, and you can go tell them to grab it rather than them having to try to find it. Um, and lastly, if there is an emergency, people aren't running around with like a chicken with their head cut off because you've already discussed, I'm going to be in charge. You're going to call someone. You're going to help me if I need the help. Great. We're all good. Okay. Make sure the gate is unlocked. Perfect. And hopefully never anything ever happens. So another thing that you want to prepare for is actually collecting the health information. Um, some of the things that you might want to put on a small little recipe card is their name, their date of birth, hospitalization number, allergies, medical conditions, medications, parents name and phone number. It all can fit on a nice little cute recipe card, whatever works for you, the smaller the better, um, but you should kind of get that general information. Um, why are you collecting that information? Because it allows you to know what to watch out for. Typically you're going to transfer that information onto your little recipe card from a big long medical uh, form. And so you know as you're writing down that this player has an allergy to bees, you're going to go ask them, do you have an EpiPen? Can you make sure you bring it every, every practice and every game? And so you're already going to know that that person has a deathly allergy or something like that. So you actually have this information ahead of time. Um, the cards themselves can be super handy to just pass off to the person that uh, is dealing with the emergency. So if they're going into an ambulance and they don't have their parents, just pin that card to their jersey. Let, the, let it go with them. Then they have the hospitalization number, they have the parents' phone numbers. Uh, and so it's easy just to pass that information on. Another thing is, is that if the parents aren't around, uh, you're not fumbling to try to find that parent's phone number. You're not asking this player to call his mom to get you know, the player's mom's number. It's just right then and there for you. So it's just quick, it's easy, and you, you want everything to be quick and easy and um, very smooth if there is an emergency. So there was concerns about collecting uh, health information and the security of it. Um, the thing is, is that there is a Health Information Protection Act within Saskatchewan, so it's HIPAA. Um, this only applies, so I read it a really, really long time ago. I reread it. Um, it was 40 pages, not too bad, but I skimmed through it mostly. But anyways, um, it, may, it, it only applies to medical professionals. Nowhere does it state anything about, um, you know, it's someone in a coaching position. Uh, so I was looking for more resources to try to be able to answer this question. Uh, there's a lot of situations in the States and they actually have another HIPAA, it's H-I-I-P, I think, A. So it's, it's a completely different uh, act. Uh, it's specific to the States, but it was brought forth mainly for kind of um, professional sporting individuals and because their information was, you know, getting leaked to media and stuff like that. So it was... Uh, uh, it has to do with them being an employee versus uh, an actual um, medical or a, a, a client or something like that. So um, it didn't really apply to us here in Canada. But anyways, so as far as I know, there is no um, policies or procedures regarding having coaches collecting this information. Um, and so within the, the Health Information Act, um, this is kind of just the opening remarks of it. And then it, within the 40 pages, it just goes on all of these different topics. Uh, but the, the key information with this act is saying that um, you're gonna collect that information in order to keep that, uh, that individual safe, as long as the information is collected and it's uh, staying confidential and it's not uh, being spread to people that don't need to know it. 
So it's on a need to know basis, it is confidential, and it's only for the safety and health of that individual. And collecting it to have it as a, a, an emergency card would be considered, uh, you know, in to keep them safe. So, and you have to keep it in a safe, confidential location. And uh, when you are done with it, so the athlete actually leaves the team or ages out or quits or whatever you actually destroy the the information itself um, because there's really no treatments or anything provided it doesn't need to be kept in a secure location you can just you can just um, uh, you can just throw well you know put it through the, the shredder so the next thing that I want to move on to is um, different information that might be helpful to know uh, and so in this, in this section, I wanted to kind of talk about kind of some, some uh, helpful conditions that you might see on during practices or on the sidelines, um, and then going into uh, dealing with ambulance, and then, you know, kind of understanding hurt versus injured. So to start off, we're going to talk about acute illnesses and injuries. So asthma, allergy, diabetes, and then major uh, musculoskeletal injuries. So we'll start off with that asthma. I'm going to make the assumption that most people know what asthma is. Uh, it is where the uh, there's vasoconstriction, so um, tightening of, of the breathing tube, and so people have trouble breathing. Uh, this can be caused by allergies or exercise induced. Sometimes it can be caused by a mixture of both. Likely you're going to be seeing more of the exercise induced asthma. Uh, these guys, they typically know what's going on um, and they should have an inhaler close by. Uh, if they don't have that inhaler close by, make fun of them later, deal with the emergency, please. But, uh, you know, because we all know you just want to be like, oh God, why, you know, that this happens. Why don't you have this with you? But deal with that later. Uh, so clearly the treatment is using an inhaler uh, and the most common uh, medication is Ventolin and uh, these emergency inhalers are blue no, no matter what the medication is. So you're likely going to see um, a blue inhaler and that's usually a sign that it is an emergency response inhaler. Um, and so the colors do mean uh, what kind of inhalers they are. So really all you need to know is look for blue ones. So the kid forgot his inhaler or it's not close by. Um, find out if it's close enough for someone to grab. Uh, you don't grab it, the, the player doesn't go grab it. Go get another player, go get a manager, go get another coach to grab it. Um, stay with the player, uh, just kind of talk to them, keep them calm. Uh, and then hopefully someone can bring it pretty quickly. Um, you can always contact their parents. If it's a game, they might have it in the purse and they can just run it down. It might be in the car. So, uh, you know, contact the parents to see if they have one available and they can bring it quickly. If there is no way to get their inhaler, another option is to put them in this tripod position. So where they're kind of leaning forward, resting their arms on their thighs. Um, when you rest your arms like that, it actually allows your uh, accessory respiratory muscles to kind of kick in. So it's actually more efficient breathing. And so that's why you would kind of lean them forward and let them rest their arms down. Um, and then you would have some pursed lip breathing. So that's actually in through the nose and then out through a mouth with kind of like you would blow out a candle, but not that hard. So it's more you're breathing in through the nose and then out through the mouth. So it allows that positive pressure uh, to kind of keep the airway open a little bit more than uh, if they're trying to. <sighs> so give them or get them to purse lip breathe. Um, so. Commonly, there's usually at least a second or third asthmatic on the team, and uh, they have the exact same blue inhaler. Uh, technically, it's recommended not to use someone else's inhaler. Uh, and I've been trying to think of how I would phrase this, but it's not like I haven't done that before. Uh, as long as you don't recommend it, it's not like you recommended it, so. Um, if that is your last resort and they're actually having an asthma attack, um, you know, use your judgment. 
Uh, okay, so if they do have the inhaler, um, hopefully they know how to use that uh, and they can do it themselves. But in the case that for some reason they forgot um, or they're actually really, really struggling and they need some help, uh, shake the inhaler, remove the cap, uh, just be aware that a lot of times that these young athletes uh, have already lost the cap. So there might not be a cap. Don't be looking for a cap if it doesn't have a cap. Uh, but anyways, remove the cap, get them to breathe out as much as possible. When the inhaler goes to the mouth, uh, it is depressed and then they breathe in uh, at the same time that the um, inhaler is depressed. And then they're supposed to hold their, their breath for about 10 seconds. Um, so that was a little bit of a quick transition, but uh, moving into an allergic reaction. Uh, so some of these causes can be environmental. So environmental can be pollen, grass, but it can also be um, maybe some poison oak or poison ivy, some bug bites. Uh, lots of time you can get allergic reaction with food, uh, various other things as well. But um, these are, those are kind of the most common ones and the ones we're going to see. Um, Typically, if it's just a mild allergic reaction, you're going to tell them to stop scratching and uh, grab a Kleenex and tell them to go sit down or something. Um, there, you, with a mild reaction, um, medication is typically already recommended by a doctor or pharmacist, which would be typically Benadryl. Um, so if they have that or they've been recommended to take that, you can tell them that they should go take their medication. Now, if they're having a severe re uh, reaction, uh, this is considered anaphylaxis. Um, I think we all are kind of aware of this and we kind of know what it is and hopefully we can kind of recognize it. It's a very severe allergic reaction. Um, they're they're going to have swelling, not necessarily whole body swelling, um, but you know they might have swelling in and around their lips. They might have swelling in the tongue. They're likely going to even actually have um, the choking kind of sign. Um, they might have that. They might not. Um, but you can tell that they're struggling for air, uh, and so that's the biggest thing is is that you know their air their airway is is you know collapsing. It's it's swollen so there's really no way for the air to come in or out um, more severe than uh, an, an asthma attack. Um, this isn't a, med a medical emergency you need to call 911. Uh, there's no question even if they have an EpiPen you need to be calling 911 because even if they administer the EpiPen um, there's no guarantees that it's going to be um, you know enough and not only that but they just got a big old shot of epinephrine they should be looked at by a doctor after that anyways so um, always call 911 in that case um, and how we actually administer it got a quick little video you can help a person with an epinephrine auto injector by finding it preparing it giving it or guiding the person in using it remove the safety cap Firmly push the tip of the epinephrine auto-injector against the outer thigh. Hold the auto-injector in place as directed, usually for 5 to 10 seconds. Very informative. Uh, these auto-injectors will very much always have a lid, um, so always take that lid off. Uh, and notice how uh, it was put directly through the pants, and she was wearing some cargo pants, so there were some extra layers. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, you know, if someone does give you a uh, auto injector or EpiPen kind of at, you know, at a game or something like that, can you hold this for me? Just take a quick look. There's usually some pictures on the side, how to use it. Typically they're all used the same way, but you know, don't be scared just to take a quick look, kind of look at the pictures, read the quick little caption, just so that you know, um, in the case that you actually do need to use it. Um, a question was brought up about uh, about an actually administering medication. Um, I do teach the sport first responder through Red Cross and um, I just thought I'd pull up this slide from them uh, just because it is really good at outlining that technically no one other than physicians should be administering medication. Um, and me administering medication is uh, physically putting the pill in the mouth, um, actually, you know, injecting with the injector, um, actually spraying the spray of the inhaler. So technically, uh, you're not really supposed to be doing that. Um, but I'm also a firm believer that in an actual emergency, if they are in like unable to do it, I'm not going to just stand around and watch. So using your best judgment. 
So, but if they're completely capable, yeah, you are definitely not helping them. You're just maybe opening the packet. You're maybe taking lids off. You're maybe shaking it, whatever. Um, yeah, you're def you can definitely do all the steps up until administration. So the next medical condition I wanted to chat about was diabetes. Um, I'm finding this is a little bit more prevalent uh, these days. Um, I'm seeing kind of more and more um, athletes with diabetes. What you're going to typically see is type 1 di diabetic, uh, and this is where they actually don't produce insulin. So they're likely, uh, you know, they likely have an insulin pump or they're actually giving themselves a, a regular shot. Um, so some things that you're going to see is uh, that this individual that is in a diabetic emergency, they, they, they're very lethargic. And I use the word lethargic because um, it's, it's more than tired. It's not just exhausted from exercise. Like it's, it's different. And you'll notice it's different. They look dazed. They might look ill. They might, be, they might report that they're feeling ill. Um, another big thing is, is that uh, you know, individuals that are having anaphylactic shock or having an asthma attack, they know what's going on and they kind of know what needs to be done. These guys, they um, might not actually know what's going on. They, they might be quite confused and dazed and, and, you know, you might even think like, are you concussed? But knowing their medical information, you might look back and be like, oh, okay, this is actually a diabetic medical emergency. Um, so knowing that information is super, super helpful. Um, so to treat this, uh, there's um, super cheap, you know, uh, these, I think they're like five to $10 little tubes of glucose tabs. So if you have a diabetic on your team, it's nice to have that in your medical kit. Uh, you would just provide them with the two to five glucose tabs, they chew them up, uh, and then they virtually just wait for them to, you know, make them feel better. If those aren't available, some sort of orange juice, Powerade or Gatorade. But um, these days we're getting lots of beverages with no sugar in them. So don't provide them with a beverage that doesn't have any sugar. It's just not going to help them. So make sure you're providing them with uh, something that's actually going to help. Something with lots and lots of sugar. Um, now, I didn't even touch upon like if it's a high blood sugar level or a low blood sugar level. I didn't touch on that because um, in an emergency, it doesn't matter what it is. Always provide sugar, no matter what. If, you, if they're diabetic and they just don't seem right, give them some sugar. Never provide insulin. First of all, you can't provide that. And second of all, it's unlikely it's actually the insulin they need. If they've been working out, they likely used all their glucose stores. Um, if they haven't been working out, it's possible that they gave themselves too much insulin because they forgot and they gave themselves a double dose. And that can happen. <laughs> so always, always, always give them sugar. Um, if they ha have too high of a blood sugar level, it's better to give them too much sugar than to actually not, for them to not have enough. So always sugar. So major musculoskeletal injuries. These are your fractures, your dislocations, your knee injuries, so on. So the kind of the scary things that you're like, I don't know what to do with that. What do I do with that? Uh, biggest thing, splint it. Um, lots of different ways. If you're going to take a basic first aid course, you're going to learn how to splint some things. And hopefully you know what's in your kit because you took, you know, you took note of it when you did your EAP. But uh, learning how to splint different things so that they're nice and supported so you can send them to the hospital uh, or send them home with their mom. Hopefully they're going to go to the hospital if they're splinted. But um, two different types of slings that can be used. Uh, you learn those in basic first aid as well. Um, you know, you're not always going to have the same supplies around. So really just using what you can find. Um, Dr. Haru, one of the sports stock, used a flip-flop one time. Uh, so that was interesting. Um, you know, blankets are great stabilizers too. You got a broomstick, great. You got some crutches, great. Uh, you know, it's, it's, and these, these splints are super, super cheap as well. Um, cheap as in low, low cost, not cheap as in they fall apart. They're actually pretty good sturdy things. So, um, you know, low cost splinting is, is uh, these speed splints. So they're good to have in your kit as well. So what happens if you're like, I don't know how to splint that. That thing is like, I don't know, what is that? Mid, mid, 
mid lower leg, um, go ahead, Google it. <laughs> keep keep the the athlete calm um, if you don't know how to splint it and they're pretty calm and you have time to google something who cares if you're googling how to splint a, an ankle uh, you know you just need to get them off the field you just need to get them into their parents car um, you know and if if worse comes to worse and you don't know how to splint it and um, they're not moving just leave them there keep them stable keep them calm call an ambulance let the ambulance do it um, and so that does lead us into our next uh, section, but I'll kind of pause for there. Um, so regarding these injuries, what you do want to do is you do want to support the joint above and below the injury. Um, splint it in the position it was found. So if it's at a crazy weird angle, if you can splint it, splint it. If you can't, call EMS. Um, keep the athlete comfortable. The more comfortable they are, the less likely you actually have to deal with, um, you know, emergency. Because if they go into shock, that turns into an emergency. So keep them comfortable, keep them happy, make some jokes. Uh, definitely don't relocate it, no matter what it is. Uh, don't move it all in all different directions because you think you're like, is that collarbone broken? It looks like a big tent, but can you move your shoulder? Uh, that's just going to cause them to go into a little bit of shock as well. Not a great idea. Uh, if you are splinting it, don't put pressure directly over where you think the injury is. Um, kind of go around the injury so that uh, it can just be supported but not compressed. So that does lead into the ambulance area. Um, so when do we call an ambulance? Um, clearly if there's an emergency. Um, emergencies would be anything wrong with their airway, breathing, or circulation. So as we mentioned, anaphylaxis is considered an airway um, emergency. So, and it's also a breathing emergency because they're not breathing correctly. Um, so always call 911 for that. Um, and anything circulation wise, uh, it's pretty rare that we would have issues with the heart with the athletes, but it's possible with um, coaches, it's possible with um, people in the stands. Uh, I mean, you never know, maybe it's the janitor that, you know, looks after the school while you're practicing. So, um, you know, always make sure that if there is an airway breathing or circulation emergency, you're calling 911. Um, if the athlete is unconscious, you're supposed to call 911 as well. Uh, I, I, I do give an exception with that. A lot of times if um, they're concussed and then they go unconscious, they come to and they actually feel really fine. I'm fine. Like I feel like a hundred bucks, thousand bucks, whatever. Um, so they can be unconscious. They come to and they actually feel really, really good. Um, no matter what, if they've been unconscious, they have a concussion, don't let them back in. But you might want to keep an eye on them instead of sending them to the hospital in that case. So if they seem perfectly fine, they're acting normal, um, you know, they, they're, you know, perfectly coherent, just keep an eye on them, get one of your student trainers to look after them for the rest of the game. Um, don't put them back in, but um, keep an eye on them. Now, if they're unconscious, and they don't come to you call 911. If they're unconscious, and they come to but they're incoherent, um, their verbal skills are, you know, non existent, uh, they're not super, super alert, you call 911. If they're in and out of consciousness, uh, you call 911. So unless it's the case of like, yeah, they kind of reset their computer with a concussion. Um, usually, you sh if there is an issue with consciousness, you should be calling 911. Uh, last is a spinal cord injury. So if you suspect a spinal cord injury, um, unless you know for sure that it's not one, just leave them on the field and call 911. Now going into those major musculoskeletal injuries that I was kind of chatting about, um, if they're on the field and you can't get them off, so either you can't get them off because uh, they're in excruciating pain and they don't want to move, you can't get them off because it's not safe, um, you know, there's you can't splint it, whatever, uh, then you would call 911, get them to come splint it, take them off the field. But if it's, you know, a, a dislocated shoulder and they're actually super um, stable, they're making jokes, they're just like, oh, I can't believe this happened to me. Uh, and we're going to be in next week and making jokes with you and stuff like that. If they can, if they can walk, they're stable, they're really not stressed, um, bring them to the sidelines, sling them up, and then call their parents. So in, a, in reality, let their parents kind of take them to the hospital rather than um, taking the ambulance. That being said, uh, 
if you take an ambulance, then you're actually more likely to get service and care quicker, but you know, that's a side point. Uh, all right, so another concern is, well, what if we call the ambulance and they, this person gets charged and now they're mad at me? Um, I, I really don't want any coach, I don't want anyone ever to be concerned about this. When in doubt, just call the ambulance. Um, if you make a call and no care is provided, so they show up and nothing's needed, no one will get charged. I would rather have an ambulance there and be like, oops, sorry, false alarm, uh, than you to not call because they're like, because you're like, do I call? Do I not call? Mm, I don't know. Uh, just call them. And if they're not needed, they will leave um, and no one will be charged. Another concern is, well, can they afford this, this ambulance call? Because it's about 250 bucks for an ambulance ride, no matter how little care it is, it's minimum 250. Um, now, another thing is, is that, you know, most parents have some sort of coverage to cover that ambulance ride. And I do know that there are families out there that don't have coverage and they can't afford that. Um, uh, poor Mike Thomas, but I'm going to put him under the, throw him under the bus because um, anyone that is registered in uh, Football Sask will be paying fees to Football Sask. Part of that fee is insurance. And if you cannot, if the player cannot afford to pay for that ambulance, Football Sask will find that coverage. So as a coach, I never want you to be concerned about um, cost. Is this so appropriate? If you think that you need to call an ambulance, just call the ambulance. I would prefer that it's called and not needed, then all of a sudden an emergency actually goes crazy awry because there's no one to help you. So um, it, yeah, when in doubt, just call. Now, um, all right, so we don't need an ambulance. They're actually pretty good. They're pretty stable. They're making jokes. How do we get them to the hospital? The first option is always the parents. Give the parents a call, see if they can come pick them up. If that isn't an option for some reason or um, parents are pretty far away, um, your next option would probably be a team manager. And, and I think some uh, coaches, parents, uh, you know, volunteers and stuff like that are concerned about insurance. Once again, um, there's a lot of insurance in place, uh, either from Football Sask or, you know, uh, you know, tip schools as well. So um, you should be covered to be able to take uh, your, your player to the hospital. Um, typically, if they're uh, a minor, you, you probably should be staying with them until their parents can show up. So hopefully you have that little card that has their parents' information on it and you can call them and say, I'm taking your kid to the hospital, meet me there. Um, but uh, so that really should be how it, it goes. Um, and pre-establishing uh, pre who's going to do that when you do your EAP would be a good option as well. So this uh, last little bit here, hurt versus injured, not last little bit, but last bit of the phase two, um, hurt versus injured. So a lot of coaches are curious, when can I get my player just to play through it? Or when do I actually have to, you know, recommend going to see someone? Um, I found this actually a really, really hard topic to kind of pick apart and make recommendations um, because you know, I, I would do a lot of things to even determine, can they play through this or uh, do we actually need to rest this? Do we need to deal with this? Um, and so it's super, super hard to kind of narrow it down to some kind of basic principles, but I tried. <laughs> so uh, first of all, we're gonna start with hurt. So uh, this is something that they should and, and can play through. Um, nothing really happened. It's just kind of sore now. It's or maybe it's been sore for a while and gradually getting worse. And I just thought I'd tell tell you about it now. Um, sometimes they can play through things, th these things. Uh, that's going to be kind of more of an overuse injury. Um, a lot of times overuse injuries can be played through. Uh, sometimes it's because they had a really, really uh, a, you know, one day they were throwing like crazy, crazy amounts. And so now they have kind of a tennis elbow. Um, if their job isn't to throw the ball, uh, who cares, right? It doesn't matter if they have a tennis elbow and they're not the quarterback, not a big deal. So they can play through some tennis elbow. They can play through some shin splints, some jumper knees. Um, you know, if they kind of rolled their ankle and they're like, yeah, it kind of hurts. It, it just hurts when I like push off, um, get one of the trainers to tape it up, see if it helps. Um, and they're like, yeah, yeah, that feels better. Great. 
let them play. Uh, same thing with a wrist. Like, oh, it hurts when I kind of push now because the other day I just did something that kind of hurts. Get one of the girls to tape it up. Doesn't make it feel better. If it does, great. Let them see if they can play through it. Um, you know, non-traumatic Achilles issues uh, can usually be played through. Achilles tendonitis has happened. They're better if, they res if they're rested, but um, there's an off season for that. <laughs> uh, and so typically those kind of gradual, uh, gradual set in injuries can be worked through a little bit. Um, if they're really, really persistent and they're getting really, really bad, they should be seeing someone. But just kind of see, you, you can kind of push them a little bit through those. Now, um, if there is a heart injury that's caused by trauma, um, those are kind of the minor ankle or wrist injuries. Like I said, try some tape on it, see if it helps. Um, and if they feel like it's actually doing okay, then let them keep playing. Um, another one, another thing that I find comes along when we have camps and uh, the rookies come up is um, DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. So we see these rookies come in and they haven't really worked that hard uh, in, you know, in their career yet. And so they come in um, day two, three or four. And for some reason, they're, they're just outrageously sore. They can hardly move. Um, and they're kind of, the soreness is specifically kind of in the muscle, usually in the muscle belly, uh, comes on with movement. There was no mechanism, nothing actually happened to, happened to them. And it's usually both sides. So, you know, it happened a couple of days after a really, really hard workout. This is delayed on onset muscle soreness. Um, if they've never had it before, they're going to be quite confused and they're going to be sore. Get them to warm up, be like, uh, go warm up. And then say, how are you feeling? They're going to be like, oh, it feels a little bit better. Just, yeah, they can play through DOMS. If their muscles are sore, yeah, you're out of shape. Keep going, right? So it's okay. They can play with that sort of stuff. They can practice with that. Now, here's the injured part. I'm hoping that uh, if there was a big mechanism and they kind of twisted their knee or had a major injury like a dislocation, you know, to give them some, uh, some time. They're going to need a little bit of time. Um, but, you know, you might not have seen them roll their ankle or twist their knee or whatever. Um, so usually an injury happens with a mechanism, not always. Uh, and yeah, how do you differentiate um, an injury that is just minor to something that actually needs some care? Uh, a lot of times there's lots of swelling, lots of bruising. This might not show up till the next day. Uh, they might be unwilling to move. A big thing is, is that their performance is actually affected. So say you did try throwing some tape on it and they're limping when they're running, they can't jump as high, they're not nearly as fast. Um, you know, this is kind of a sign that they probably do need to be looked at. Um, and something that isn't a delayed onset muscle soreness, that is a muscle pain. Um, a lot of times they'll actually say, well, I was doing this activity and I felt it go, or um, I just felt like I got shot in the back of the leg. Um, or you actually see them kind of pull up when they're running. So they're sprinting and all of a sudden they just grab the back of their leg. Uh, so these are, these can be pretty major. Um, and, you know, you really don't want them to be working through um, those type of injuries. So give them a little bit of a break. Um, if it doesn't go away in a day or two, uh, definitely send them on to some, uh, to someone to get it looked at. Uh, one, one thing about concussion and that's it. Um, so with football, there's always mechanisms happening, falling to the ground, hitting other people. They don't need head contact. They don't need to lose consciousness. If there's been any mechanism when in football, there always is a mechanism and they have any concussion like symptoms, dizziness, headache, blurry vision, foggy. Um, yes, these might be, they're dehydrated. It might be that they didn't eat properly. Um, it you know, might be that they're just out of shape, but you don't want to be wrong. Um, if they've had kind of a contact and they have concussion symptoms, just take them out. Um, there can be, we, we hear a lot about the long-term effects, but there are actually a lot of short-term effects that we really don't talk about. Um, and they can be pretty devastating as well. So management of these hurt versus injured for both of them, just put some ice on it. Like how hard is it to say it? Put some ice on it. Uh, for the rest of the night, 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, see if it's any better the next day. A lot of times that's all it needs is a little bit of TLC and it's fine the next day. Um, make them sit out a little bit and just see how it is because they might have that stub toe effect. So they might 
you know, when you stub your toe and it's the worst thing in the world. And then five minutes later, you're like, yeah, I'm fine. I don't even feel it anymore. Uh, that can happen with any type of injury. So they might roll their ankle and they're rolling around in severe pain. You get them to sit on the side for five minutes and then they're back to normal. So um, let them sit out, just let them sit out, let them work it out, ask them how they are in five to 10 minutes. Um, but always ask the next day how they're doing. So see if, uh, you know, is there any swelling? Is there bruising? Is it painful? Um, if there is, if it is quite swollen, bruised, painful, maybe you should send them to see someone. So phase three, resources. Um, provincially, uh, you know, I kind of touched a little bit on the Sports Med Science Council. This is actually a really, really, I can't stress it enough, a really good resource for anyone, for any sport. Uh, for really anything. They have um, resources for consultants that are um, rehab based. So uh, uh, athletic therapists, physiotherapists, chiros, massage, they have sports docs, they have uh, psychologists, they have um, nutritionists. So they have kind of the sports and the science, um, strength and conditioning coaches, um, you know, and they can provide presentations, they provide courses, um, they can provide forms, they actually have an EAP that you can literally bring off, off their website and, and then use, go ahead, use it, they, they provide it for you. So, um, you know, that might be something you always want to keep uh, maybe on your on your homepage so that you can just click it and kind of explore their website. Um, you can always look at the professional um, web pages. So professional pages for your physios, your chiros, your athletic therapists, your massage therapists. Um, you can use this for, you know, finding local practitioners. Um, you can, you know, use it just to kind of, they, sometimes they have a lot of information on those pages. Like they have someone write up something about an overuse injury, or sometimes they have like little promo videos and stuff like that. So they're always good, you know, um, resources to look at and they're legit resources as well. Um, I was kind of listening to some of the previous presentations and a lot of times they were commenting on, um, you know, previous experiences working with this team and that team and I contacted this coach. Um, you know, you, we have uh, guest coaches all the time during our camps and stuff like that. And I know the, the Rams do that too. Uh, you know, those people that are in high school programs working through these, make friends with the coaches and, and you know, all the junior programs and university programs, they have therapists. They can at least, they know someone to ask if you have a question. So, you know, make some friends, ask some questions. It's not hard to, you know, play phone tag with text messages. Um, and I know for a fact that typically the, the therapists that those teams are working with, they're always welcome to answer questions. So um, don't be scared to ask others. Locally, um, uh, contact clinics. Don't be scared to see if there is someone that wants to volunteer their time. Uh, I know for a fact that there's therapists out there that they want to get involved with a team, but they don't know how, and they just haven't been given the opportunity. So make some cold calls, call a clinic, say, hey, I see on uh, this guy's bio that he really likes working with sport. Does he want to work with our team? Um, and maybe he does and hasn't really had the chance. He just likes working with sport because it says it in his bio. <laughs> um, but anyways, you can, uh, see if anyone's wanting to help out the team. Um, and you know, it might even give you the opportunity to make friends with a therapist so that you can maybe message them directly, uh, in case you have questions about an injury or if something should be looked at. Um, I've definitely seen lots of text pictures that are kind of weird and crazy. And I'm like, yep, that needs to be seen. So, um, make a friend with, uh, with a therapist and start texting them. <laughs> um, Use your student trainers, but make sure that they're trained. Uh, get them that basic first aid, get them that taping, and then you know have a talk at the beginning. And and um, uh, if you don't, you know, to have a talk at the beginning, tell them what ex is expected of them. If you send someone to the side, tell them what they should be asking, so that you, as the coach, don't have to spend ten minutes asking those questions. And you can just go over and be like, "What's up?" And then they can kind of give you a summary of what's going on. So use your student trainers. Um, another option is if you're in a small area, there's likely some hockey teams, lacrosse teams, soccer teams, um, and maybe they have some good connections with therapists, with sports docs, with maybe even just a, a GP that you know is super um, helpful with questions and stuff like that. So don't be scared to contact other teams. And I mean, we all know that the sporting community is pretty small. So usually 
someone is involved in sport and, or in football and hockey at the same time. But so you might already have those uh, connections. Uh, the last one that I want, the last things I want to talk about is um, Global Dro. So this is a website. It's a super super helpful website. Uh, it actually um, you can input your sport, your country, and a, a drug like a off the counter shelf you know, um, prescription drugs, whatever, you can input it and find out if it's actually um, prohibited or banned uh, within the hockey or football community and stuff like that. So uh, you can look it up and they, it's, it's, anyone can use it. It's literally the easiest thing ever. And I've had it, I mean, I, I get it a lot as a medical professional, but you know, someone comes up to me and they show me, show me something and they're like, can I take this? And I'll be like, I don't know. So I look it up. Um, and I know in the high school level, it's pretty rare that they would ever get drug tested, but you know, when they hit the U16, U18 levels for the provincial teams, um, they have a high chance of getting tested it, during the competitions and, and, you know, making this particular website aware for your, um, athletes is, is, is a good option so they can look it up themselves. Um, another is, uh, using the resources like Canadian Concussion Collaborative or Parachute Canada. They have, um, they're legit sources that have really good information about concussions. You can Google concussion and get a, oh, so much information. Um, you know, people are wanting to, you know, act like they know everything. And so they're, everyone's putting stuff on the internet, acting like they know what to do. And this is the best option. And this is what you need to do. Uh, your best option is going directly to the source and Canadian Concussion Collaborative and Parachute Canada, they literally bring it to a, a level that everyone can understand. And it is um, the best information you can get. So those are some really good uh, resources to look at if, you, um, if you're interested in that sort of stuff. Um, Parachute Canada is for injury in general, um, but they have a really good section on concussion. Another is U Sports. So they have a lot of good resources if you click through their crazy websites and stuff like that, but also a good uh, le legit resource that isn't gonna give you crap um, or useless information, um, but it's good for outlines. It's good for recommendations. It's, you know, you, you sometimes, I think I found a EAP on there as well. Um, they also outline jobs for, you know, your medical professionals as well as student trainers and stuff like that. So maybe that's an option that you wanna use there. So from all of this, uh, what can you do? <laughs> Hopefully we can answer that. Uh, the biggest thing is, is uh, be prepared. Take a course every three years. Make sure you renew it. Um, write up an EAP. It seems ridiculous. Um, even I thought EAPs were ridiculous in the beginning of my career, but I sure as heck do them now. Um, preparing medical summary cards so you know your athletes. Um, and make an outline and talk to your trainers of what you expect from them. Um, next thing is make some friends, local, local therapists, um, provincial coaches, make those connections so that if you do have injury questions, you can ask someone and they can direct you in the right direction. Um, and then have an idea of where you can look for good resources. Sports Med Science Council of Saskatchewan is a great one, um, professional websites, and then, you know, just talking with local cl clinics as well. So that brings me to, anyone have any questions? <laughs> 